I am terrible about summarizing other authors' books, and I'm terrible at summarizing people's biographies. So if we could just start, if you would tell um, the esteemed audience a little bit about yourself and your background in publishing. Yes. Um, I realize the longer I'm in publishing, the longer this story gets. So I'm going to try and keep it condensed. Um, I grew up in Texas. I went away to college um, in the Midwest when I was 18. My goals for college were to get far away from my family, sorry, mom and dad, uh, and see snow. Uh, and so I ended up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at Marquette University. Um, I was a creative writing major and an elementary education major. And the two sort of merged midway. And I had the epitome of a really good liberal arts education because I had professors who recognized that I had this growing interest in children's books. Um, this was some years ago. Uh, I graduated college in 2000, so it's it's been a minute. Um, so publishing children's books weren't quite as well known um, and as visible as, as they are today as an industry, but I had professors who recognized that I had this this interest and they encouraged the curiosity. They didn't necessarily know how to help connect me to publishing because it's a long way from Milwaukee to New York City, um, but they encouraged the curiosity and I kind of found my my own way. Um, I did some internships. I had a professor who was a great mentor um, and eventually I ended up in New York City, um, which is where a young person goes when they want to work in publishing. Um, and how old and were you coming uh, from the Midwest when you when you arrived in New York? So I took two years between graduating college and um, moving to New York. I went to a very activist college. Everybody went off to save the world for a couple of years. Um, and so I did my version of that. Um, I actually spent a couple of years as a youth minister, um, which a lot of people think, wow, well, that has nothing to do with book publishing. Um, to me, it actually has a lot to do with book publishing um, because it's about building relationships and understanding what's at the heart of humans and um, and engaging with them around it. So I did that for a couple of years, um, but I knew the whole time that my goal was to come to New York and work in children's books. Um, the problem is that I moved here in 2002, which was not long after 9-11 and the whole industry was in a hiring freeze. So I went on lots of interviews where people said, you're great, we're not hiring. Um, eventually I did finally get a job though. Um, it wasn't the job that I thought I wanted, I wanted to be an editor, um, but I ended up in a marketing job at Clarion Books, which is part of Houghton Mifflin. At the time it was just Houghton Mifflin, now it's Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, and it turned out to be one of the most secretly valuable things that ever could have happened to me because I realized very quickly that no one wanted me to write my English majory five paragraph essays about books and no one wanted me to even decide if I liked books or not. My job was to think about who the books were for, who the audience was and how to sell to them. Um, and so it really kind of recalibrated my whole point of view and has turned out to be um, ever since kind of a, a secret superpower, I think, because um, had I started as an editor on a floor with only other editors, I think it would have taken me longer to understand how the editing part of the puzzle fits into all the rest of publishing and how the publishing industry connects with uh, consumers and book buyers. Um, but I was seeing it sort of up close and personal. I also worked at a small imprint. Um, we were a team at that time of 14 or 15. And so I really kind of got to look over everybody's shoulders and understand how do all the different pieces of the industry connect to one another. Um, and I had a boss who'd been doing her job for 30 years and she was very good at it, but she was, you know, also was very happy to let me go do the things that I was excited about. So um, I learned a lot from that job and I got to interact with um, amazing authors and illustrators. Um, you know, I, I sometimes describe that first year that I worked in publishing as it was like every author who'd ever been my hero walking off my bookshelves into my email. <laughs> um, I, I still remember the first time I got an email from Katherine Patterson and I kind of lost my mind. Um, but so it was, it was rightly so, what an amazing uh, email to receive. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, so that was a great start, but I still wanted to be an editor. Um, and the problem 
uh, at the time was that, and still, uh, Clarion's a great place to work, and no one ever leaves. So there, you know, there weren't any spots coming open. Um, they let me put my hand into it a little bit. They basically said, "You seem really interested in this. If you want to do a little bit of working on books." Um, kind of on your own time, um, we'll let you do that. So I actually got to work with, you know, Dinah Stevenson and Virginia Buckley and some of the great editors on books like Gary Schmidt's books and, you know, um, really, really wonderful books and got to kind of just look over everyone's shoulders a little bit more closely, which just confirmed this is what I really want to do. Um, but every time I went on an interview, I got the response of, um, you're overqualified, but you're underqualified. So finally, I thought, okay, if I'm going to be stuck in marketing, I've had the little boutique imprint experience. Let's go get the big house experience. That way, I can kind of decide for myself like what I want my path to look like. So I moved over to Harper Collins, still in the school and library marketing um, uh, vein, and did that for about another year and a half. I worked with a great team there, um, but finally, I went to HR and I said. I work with great people, I'm working on great projects, but I'm on the wrong side of the table in every meeting. I'm working on very ephemeral things like reading group guides and author brochures, and I wanna be making things that last for 30 years, not the things that you know get stuffed into the, um, you know, the duffel bag and, and who knows when they get pulled out again. Um, and so eventually I was able to move over into an internal position. Um, I, I joined what was a short-lived imprint, although we didn't know it at the time, when Brenda Bowen, who's now a literary agent herself, um, started an imprint at HarperCollins, I moved over to be her assistant editor. It was just the two of us for a little while. We were joined by another editor. Um, then 2008 happened, which was the recession in publishing, and it hit publishing hard. And they ended up closing the imprint because it was so new that it was just an expense and there wasn't any income coming in from it. Um, luckily, they they laid off Brenda, but they kept um, the other editor, Anne, that I was working with, uh, and me, and they moved us over to a different imprint. Um, and by that time, you know, so then, then we started working um, there. And by that time, I was six or seven years in, and I was like, let me at the books. I just want to be an editor. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so when they, uh, finally let me start acquiring books. I hit the ground running in a way that I think no one really expected um, because I had been watching and waiting <laughs> uh, for my turn. And along the way, I had built up a lot of connections and a lot of um, relationships that mattered a lot to my books. Um, so the second book I ever signed up was a book that some folks might have heard of called Divergent. Um, and that series uh, ate my life for the next couple of years because it got um, pretty big, which was exciting, um, at times overwhelming, uh, but mostly really exciting. Um, I left- Divergent, was that, was that a small indie title? I can't recall. A small, a small <laughs> little indie book. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and it was, it was a good time. Um, it, you know, it's interesting to see all the things you can do when a book becomes a conversation piece that everyone's cousin or aunt or sister-in-law is reading when you don't have to stop and explain the book to people, you know, when you could just engage in the conversation with them. And it's interesting to see, you know, um, what happens when, when a publisher puts a lot of resources in tandem with a movie studio's resources and it you know can can take over the world for a blip <laughs> um which you know or at least to a certain subset of kids the interesting thing is you know to us in publishing i mean that first book came out in 2011 which in publishing time is you know um both a blink uh and a really long time ago and the, the market's evolved a lot since um and you know, in, in terms of what the market is looking for now, it's very different things. But one of the sort of pleasant surprises of the last couple of years for me has been two things that teenagers, like new teenagers, today's 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds are still finding that series and reading it, which is pretty exciting to realize like, oh, it's it's living beyond its initial audience. You know, it's it's gone and refreshed the audience a couple of times. Um, 
And then the other thing that's caught me off guard, but is pretty delightful, is that um, I've had several uh, young editors tell me that they read that book in high school or in college, and now they're working in publishing, which um, says something about the way time passes for all of us, I suppose. Too fast, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so I left HarperCollins sort of to, to everyone's surprise, including my own, because I had an opportunity to go work for a startup. Um, and it was, um, I guess, in 2003, and it was around the time that uh, Random House and Penguin were emerging. It seemed like maybe there's going to be more mergers or maybe Amazon's going to eat the whole industry. Who really knows? And I had an opportunity to go get a whole different skill set, and it seemed wise. I had built up a relationship with a uh, tech startup that was publishing adjacent called Storybird. They invited me to come on board with them. They'd just gotten a big round of funding and, and basically said, come see what you can do here for a couple of years. Um, it was a great experience. I learned so much. I learned an entirely different paradigm of thinking. Um, in publishing, it's a very linear process to make a book. You have to pretty much do the same things in the same order every time with you know a small handful of variations of what can go differently. But you have to follow the same process every time because you need the end result to be books on the shelf. Um, whereas in tech, like all the rules are up for grabs all the time and in a startup especially. And you know, one minute you're thinking about the micro of here and now, and you know, you're five minutes later you're thinking about the macro of five years from now, and it, it felt like it made my brain a lot more nimble um, and also a lot more understanding of risk taking. I think, you know, um, tech, one of the things, there, there are many things I'm not sure about <laughs> with the tech world, but I think one of the things they get right is they understand failure differently than a lot of other industries, and they understand um, pending as just part of a growth process. And so if something's not working, or if users tell you that they want something different, you shift, you don't resist and resist. Um, so anyways, I learned a lot that was very interesting and that stretched my brain in really good ways. Um, I remember that that couple of years telling people that it felt like my brain was just kind of on fire every day in a really good way. Um, but eventually, as happens with startups, especially when they are venture capital funded, you know, we didn't become the next Uber, we didn't become the next Airbnb, and you run out of funding, and it's time to reinvent. Um, so for me, um, figuring out, okay, what's my next move, I knew I could go back into the editorial side, or I had a pretty strong feeling that I would be able to find a job. Um, but I also knew that, you know, I um, was was curious about other things. My whole career, I had thought about agenting at different moments. And for a lot of the time, I had thought about agenting because I couldn't get to where I wanted to be as an editor. It was kind of a, you know, like, well, maybe this would be almost as good. Um, and I, I give a lot of credit to, you know, myself at like 25 and 32 or like whatever those ages were to realize like, that's not the right reason to choose agenting and, and something that I feel is really important is, you know, um, when you decide to work as an agent, you're you're taking on people's careers and you're taking their hopes and dreams into their hands. Um, you, of course, can't control everything, would that we could, but I knew it was something I didn't want to do lightly. It wasn't something I wanted to do if I wasn't really sure of myself or didn't have, you know, hadn't really thought it through. Um, but so anyways, at different at different moments, I had thought about agenting. Uh, at different moments, people had suggested it to me a lot because I'm sort of a, a natural connector of people. You know, I'm the person who's like, oh, I have a friend that does this thing and you seem interested in that and I should put you two together. Like, I just sort of naturally do that in my life. Um, Is that your uh, ministry skills coming into play, you think? Possibly. Um, one of the things that my boss pointed out when I worked at the startup and he said, you're a pattern matcher, which is not a term I ever had for myself, but it's one that I've very much embraced since. And it's another sort of secret as an agent for sure. So my brain is good at thinking about, okay, what's the analog of this thing in another, what's, what's a similar dilemma that's been encountered by the music industry, by the film industry, um, you know, what are what are other um, 
book projects like this. I mean, the way that comes, you know, most obviously into play as an agent is, okay, if I'm putting a submission out there and I have this editor in mind of like, I think they're going to be the one that loves it. Then I ask myself, okay, who's the version of that editor at all the other houses? You know, who does that same kind of thing? And, you know, um, it can work out well. Um, so, so yeah, my brain just naturally sort of orders the world that way in, into finding, finding the commonalities, I guess, finding the universalities of things, um, the center of things. Um, so, um, after, after thinking it through really hard, I decided, you know what, um, maybe, maybe agenting wasn't the right thing for me at different earlier junctures, but maybe actually now it is. And, and one of the things that I've been really grateful to realize over the last three years that I've been agenting, a little bit more than three, I guess, um, three and a half, is that it's in fact the thing that brings together all these weird sort of disparate roles I've held and hats I've worn and lets me pull it all together for the benefit of my clients and their books and their careers. Uh, and that's really gratifying because it's, it's nice to look behind yourself and be like, oh, there was something happening this whole time. I just didn't maybe see it. Um, but in, in hindsight, it's there. Anyways, that was a much longer winded version than I promised. <laughs> no, that was a, was a wonderful overview and we'll, we'll, we're gonna go back through and, and talk about kind of each of, each of those steps uh, along the way. Cause I, I wanna pick your brain just about publishing in general and all the um, uh, the experiences you've had and the expertise that you're, you're bringing to 